Hey, good to see you all. Welcome to my channel and please like, share and subscribe my channel. So let's start. Chapter 2. Oxford and Cambridge. My father was very keen that I should go to Oxford or Cambridge. He himself had gone to University College, Oxford, so he thought I should apply there, because I would have a greater chance of getting in. At that time, University College had no fellow in mathematics, which was another reason he wanted me to do chemistry, I could try for a scholarship in natural science rather than in mathematics. The rest of the family went to India for a year, but I had to stay behind to do A-levels and university entrance. My headmaster thought I was much too young to try for Oxford, but I went up in March 1959 to do the scholarship exam with two boys from the year above me at school. I was convinced I had done badly and was very depressed when during the practical exam university lecturers came around to talk to other people but not to me. Then, a few days after I got back from Oxford, I got a telegram to say I had a scholarship. I was 17, and most of the other students in my year had done military service and were a lot older. I felt rather lonely during my first year and part of the second. It was only in my third year that I really felt happy there. The prevailing attitude at Oxford at that time was very anti-work. You were supposed to be brilliant without effort, or to accept your limitations and get a fourth-class degree. To work hard to get a better class of degree was regarded as the mark of a grey man, the worst epithet in the Oxford vocabulary. At that time, the physics course at Oxford was arranged in a way that made it particularly easy to avoid work. I did one exam before I went up, then had three years at Oxford with just die final exams at the end. I once calculated that I did about a thousand hours work in the three years I was there, an average of an hour a day. I'm not proud of this lack of work. I'm just describing my attitude at the time, which I shared with most of my fellow students, an attitude of complete boredom and feeling that nothing was worth making an effort for. One result of my illness has been to change all that. When you are faced with the possibility of an early death, it makes you realize that life is worth living and that there are lots of things you want to do. Because of my lack of work, I had planned to get through the final exam by doing problems in theoretical physics and avoiding questions that required factual knowledge. I didn't sleep the night before the exam because of nervous tension, however, so I didn't do very well. I was on the borderline between a first and second class degree and I had to be interviewed by die examiners to determine which I should get. In the interview they asked me about my future plans. I replied that I wanted to do research. If they gave me a first, I would go to Cambridge. If I only got a second, I would stay in Oxford. They gave me a first. I felt that there were two possible areas of theoretical physics that were fundamental and in which I might do research. One was cosmology, the study of the very large. The other was elementary particles, the study of the very small. I thought that elementary particles were less attractive because, although scientists were finding lots of new particles, there was no proper theory at that time. All they could do was arrange type particles in families, as in botany. In cosmology, on the other hand, there was a well-defined theory, Einstein's general theory of relativity. There was then no one in Oxford working in cosmology. But at Cambridge there was Fred Hoyle, the most distinguished British astronomer of the time. I therefore applied to do a PhD with Hoyle. My application to do research at Cambridge was accepted, provided I got a first, but to my annoyance my supervisor was not Hoyle but a man called Dennis Summer, of whom I had not heard. In the end, however, this turned out to be for the best. Hoyle was away abroad a lot, and I probably wouldn't have seen much of him. On the other hand, Summer was there, and he was always stimulating, even though I often didn't agree with his ideas. Because I had not done much mathematics at school or at Oxford, I found general relativity very difficult at first and did not make much progress. Also, during my last year at Oxford, I had noticed that I was getting rather clumsy in my movements. Soon after I went to Cambridge, I was diagnosed as having ALS, amitrophic lateral sclerosis, or motor neurone disease, as it is known in England. In the United States it is also called Lou Gehrig's disease, high doctors could offer no cure or assurance that it would not get worse. 
at first the disease seemed to progress fairly rapidly. There did not seem much point in working at my research, because I didn't expect to live long enough to finish my PhD. As time went by, however, the disease seemed to slow down. I also began to understand general relativity and to make progress with my work. But what really made the difference was that I got engaged to a girl called Jane Wilde, whom I had met about the time I was diagnosed with ALS. This gave me something to live for. If we were to get married, I had to get a job, and to get a job I had to finish my PhD. I therefore started working for the first time in my life. To my surprise, I found I liked it. Maybe it is not fair to call it work. Someone once said, scientists and prostitutes get paid for doing what they enjoy. I applied for a research fellowship at Gonville and Keys, pronounced Keys, College. I was hoping that Jane would type my application, but when she came to visit me in Cambridge, she had her arm in plaster, having broken it. I must admit that I was less sympathetic than I should have been. It was her left arm, however, so she was able to write out the application to my dictation, and I got someone else to type it. In my application I had to give the names of two people who could give references about my work. My supervisor suggested I should ask Herman Bondi to be one of them. Bondi was then a professor of mathematics at King's College, London, and an expert on general relativity. I had met him a couple of times, and he had submitted a paper I had written for publication in the journal Proceedings of the Royal Society. I asked him after a lecture he gave in Cambridge, and he looked at me in a vague way and said yes, he would. Obviously he didn't remember me, for when the college wrote to him for a reference, he replied that he had not heard of me. Nowadays, there are so many people applying for college research fellowships that if one of the candidates referees says that he does not know him, that is the end of his chances. But those were quieter times. The college wrote to tell me of the embarrassing reply of my referee, and my supervisor got into Bondi and refreshed his memory. Bondi then wrote me a reference that was probably far better than I deserved. I got the fellowship and have been a fellow of Keys College ever since. The fellowship meant Jane and I could get married, which we did in July 1965. We spent a week's honeymoon in Suffolk, which was all I could afford. We then went to a summer school in general relativity at Cornell University in upstate New York. That was a mistake. We stayed in a dormitory that was full of couples with noisy small children, and it put quite a strain on our marriage. In other respects, however, the summer school was very useful for me because I met many of the leading people in the field. My research up to 1970 was in cosmology, the study of the universe on a large scale. My most important work in this period was on singularities. Observations of distant galaxies indicate that they are moving away. From us, the universe is expanding. This implies that the galaxies must have been closer together in the past. The question then arises, was there a time in the past when all the galaxies were on top of each other and the density of the universe was infinite? Or was there a previous contracting phase, in which the galaxies managed to avoid hitting each other? Maybe they flew past each other and started to move away from each other. To answer this question required new mathematical techniques. These were developed between 1965 and 1970, mainly by Roger Penrose and myself. Penrose was then at Birkbeck College, London, now he is at Oxford. We used these techniques to show that there must have been a state of infinite density in the past, if the general theory of relativity is correct. This state of infinite density is called the Big Bang Singularity. It means that science would not be able to predict how the universe would begin, if general relativity is correct. However, my more recent work indicates that it is possible to predict how the universe would begin if one takes into account the theory of quantum physics, the theory of the very small. General relativity also predicts that massive stars will collapse in on themselves when they have exhausted their nuclear fuel. The work that Penrose and I did showed that they would continue to collapse until they reached a singularity of infinite density. This singularity would be an end of time, at least for the star and anything on it. The gravitational field of the singularity would be so strong that light could not escape from the region around it but would be dragged back by the gravitational field. The region from which it is not possible to escape is called a blade hole, 
and its boundary is called the event horizon. Anything or anyone who falls into the black hole through the event horizon will come to an end of time at the singularity. I was thinking about black holes as I got into bed one night in 1970, shortly after the birth of my daughter Lucy. Suddenly I realized that many of the techniques that Penrose and I had developed to prove singularities could be applied to black holes. In particular, the area of the event horizon, the boundary of the black hole, could not decrease with time. And when two black holes collided and joined together to form a single hole, the area of the horizon of the final hole would be greater than the sum of the areas of the horizons of the original black holes. This placed an important limit on the amount of energy that could be emitted in the collision. I was so excited that I did not get much sleep that night. From 1970 to 1974 I worked mainly on black holes. But in 1974, I made perhaps my most surprising discovery, black holes are not completely black. When one takes the small-scale behavior of matter into account, particles and radiation can leak out of a black hole. A black hole emits radiation as if it were a hot body. Since 1974, one have been working on combining general relativity and quantum mechanics into a consistent theory. One result of that has been a proposal I made in 1983 with Jim Hard of Dye University of California at Santa Barbara, that both time and space are finite in extent, but they don't have any boundary or edge. They would be like the surface of the Earth, but with two more dimensions. The Earth's surface is finite in area, but it doesn't have any boundary. In all my travels, I have not managed to fall off the edge of the world. If this proposal is correct, there would be no singularities, and the laws of science would hold everywhere, including at the beginning of the universe. The way the universe began would be determined by the laws of science. I would have succeeded in my ambition to discover how the universe began. But I still don't know why it began.